about software. And there we go, go live. Okay, let's see if that works now. And we are live. Playback error. F fantastic. Isn't it awesome? Uh, anyway, could you check if we're really live? Because over here it says an, uh, a playback error. So, and we're just now checking if we are live on, face on YouTube. I'm going to refresh here to just make absolutely sure it's not on our side. It still says that we have excellent connection. We're having a connection stream, and at that moment we're still having an error playback. Okay, and week says we are live, so I think it's just over here that we have a uh, connection error, so we're just going to start. Okay, welcome to Digital Classroom. Today we have a special episode, and if Anna we can please turn down the volume. Um, today we have a special episode, and today it's about LED lighting and mixing strobes with LED lights. So how does that work? How does everything connect to each other? Well. The first thing you have to realize is that with LED lighting, there are certain limitations. We're going to talk about that during Digital Classroom. So are you ready for the stream? Yes, you are. Probably because the first stream went wrong. So let's start our trailer. Okay, and we're back. Okay, so LED lighting. We get a lot of questions about LED lighting and somehow it's like totally in fashion to use LED lighting. And what is the whole thing with LED lighting? LED lighting, of course, is continuous light source. So that means you can, actually for the technique, it's similar to using the sun outside. So you have a lot of light that's continuous there and you can control that with your shutter speed. So when we look at how that all works, it's actually the same way as outside. So don't be confused by, okay, but this is in a studio environment. Just be very, very clear, it's the same as outside. So ISO, aperture, shutter speed, they all work exactly the same as with sunlighting. And that's also where the problem comes. If you want to shoot, for example, motion, so hair, hair flicking around or a model jump, jumping upside down, okay, Anawik is not sure. Can you please go to YouTube, Anawik, and check? Yeah, I sit up YouTube. Okay, uh, guys, can you in the chat, I see that we have four viewers at the moment because we switched over. Can you guys please confirm that we are live on YouTube? Because we are really in doubt over here because we have a lot of problems at the moment with our internet. Maybe it's the solar flares, you never know. Uh, so I will just ask people, are we live? Been waiting on this. Okay, Jado, Rose, can you confirm that we are actually live and that you can see me and hear everything? Because we want to make sure that there is no issue with our stream. Okay, you are live. Okay, everybody says yes. Okay. We don't see anything here, so we're just going to continue everything and we're just going to see where it ends, you know, who knows. Okay, so LED lighting. So freezing motion with LED lighting is almost impossible for the very simple reason you don't have enough power. Think about outside with the sun, you can shoot a jumping model, but you need a shutter speed of one two thousandths of a second, maybe one thousandths of a second. You need something that will freeze that motion. And trust me, in the studio, LED lighting will not. I remember that one day uh, a salesman of LED lighting actually said, Frank, you really have to start shooting with LED, that's awesome. And I said, okay, but I want to shoot a jumping model. Oh, that's easy with LED lighting. I said, okay, but then you probably burn the model down for the very simple reason. I need so much light to shoot on one two thousandths of a second or an insane high shutter speed, or sorry, an insane high um, ISO, which we, which we don't want to do, of course. Okay, so. Today we're going to talk about LED lighting. The first setups we're going to do is just simple LED lighting only. And then afterwards I'm going to actually try to mix LED lights with strobe. So we're going to go very uh, slowly through it. Now if you think Frank looks a little bit stressed, that's absolutely true because this is the second time we started up the stream and the first time we had some issues because today we are shooting to the iPad Pro with Cast Cable. Let me show you very quickly how that looks. Believe it or not, we're shooting with USB-C to an iPad Pro and it goes really, really fast and you can do a lot of fun stuff with this cable. 
I just want to show you that later on. So overall, it's very, very cool to be able to finally do this. I started, I think, two years ago with a mobile workflow, starting everything on, for example, Lightroom, Photoshop, Affinity Photo, Luma Fusion, Project Rush from Adobe, but trying to do everything on the iPad Pro. Now, I have to be honest, at first that was a disaster. Renaming files didn't really work nicely, uh, corrupted files and whatever, a lot of problems. Now, overall, we solved a lot with, for example, File Browser Pro. We solved a lot with the new Lightrooms with selective adjustments, and it just goes very, very well. The only problem is if you want to shoot to the iPad Pro, you need something wireless. And my experience with wireless is that it doesn't really work all the time. And when you do trade shows or workshops, you want to make sure that it works all the time. So I'm not going to say that I'm never going to shoot wireless again, of course, but I need a backup. And that backup is via cable. And today we are actually showing you guys for the first time the Sony A7R 4 into cast cable on the iPad Pro. Now, the reason this works a little bit weird is that I have to route my image to the screen to see what I'm shooting. And we do that with the Chromecast. We have to route it to the Matewell that you guys can actually now see what you see on the screen. And I also have to run my laptop through the same devices. So this is why at this point we had a hub that worked really well with the first one, with the first stream. We tested it out for about a day, worked fine. And then you start to stream and we can't power up the dock anymore. So it's OVC is listening. We got a problem with one of your docks. So anyway, overall it works great, but this one, I don't know what's going on. Okay, so LED lighting. Let me first switch over to the camera settings and then I'm going to walk into the studio. We're going to work, work today with our model Lois. And we're going to start out really simple with a Fresnel light. And Fresnel, of course, is the most beautiful light source in the world, right? So let's see what we can do. Okay, so in a week, if you can take over here. Perfect. And the rest I will do, don't worry. So Enewik is taking over behind the desk. I'm gonna put this into the stop contact. Into the stop contact. <laughs> the power outlet, of course. I'm also gonna teach you guys some Dutch. Okay. Now, one of the things that I love about the Fresnel is actually the way that it works. Now, my model is gonna hate this, so please walk away for now. Just walk out of the set. <laughs> because there is a lot of light. And one of the cool things about Fresnel's, and you can actually see that now, is that I can make it bigger and smaller, the, the spot. And anyway, can you go to the, monitor, uh, the, um, the high cam? Do you have it on the high cam? Okay, so I can just open this up and now you can see that the spot becomes bigger. And this is one of the cool things about Fresnel's. You can make it really, really big. As you can see here, I'm almost lighting now the whole area. Of course, we also have barn doors, but I can also go all the way down. Is this visible, Annemiek, on the screen? Cool. So for now, I want it really small. The other thing about the Fresnel is it's actually a lens, and that lens really narrows that light in a very, very beautiful way. So when you look at the image quality at one point, it's like almost like a beauty dish. And week, what's the problem? Okay, and week is trying to solve problems that are there. Okay, so I'm gonna look at that one. Anneweek, is it wise to continue now or? Yes, of course. Okay, because I'm really not comfortable. Okay, yeah, that doesn't feel right, sorry. Sorry guys, if it feels a little bit unnatural for me, but there's too much stuff going on. We have cameras that don't work and cables that come loose, so bear with me. Okay, can you please stand there? Yeah. Awesome. Now, the first thing you will see is that it's really, really bright on our model, as you can see. So how do we solve that? Well, we can turn the volume down. There we go. So now we have a lot less light. But do we want less light? No, we want more light for the very simple reason, with less light, I need to raise my ISO. So although the model doesn't like it, <laughs> there we go, full blast. But now if it's straight on my model and with this backdrop, the backdrop really shines. So we really don't want this. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a test shot for you guys to show you what happens. And of course we have a lot of light now from the studio, but if we have a problem with it, we're gonna turn it down. Okay. 
And there we go. So this is the first shot. And it, you probably agree with me that it sucks. It doesn't really look nice. It's actually terrible. So what can you do to fix that? Well, actually, it's the angle of lighting. So also with strobes, also with natural light, and also, of course, with this kind of light, you have to work with angles. So we're going to move this up. Let me see. It's going to be a perfect blooper reel, this one. Okay, let's move that all the way up. There we go, and then aim it down. And now you can see that my reflection is totally different because now it's on top of my model and I won't see that in the final shot. Angle of reflection is angle of, of angle of incidence is angle of reflection, as you know. So I'm now cropping it out. So now for the first time I have an image without that reflection. And I and actually, for a Fresnel, I really like it. But what if you want a little bit more? Well, no problem. You just open it up. There we go. And there we have some really cool shots. Chin down just a little bit. There we go, awesome. But of course we also want it smaller. Okay, there we go. And now we have way more vignetting on the sides. I really like this a lot better. But as you can see, the face is a little bit too bright sometimes. Which camera, Annemiek? Uh, this. Okay. Sometimes the face is a little bit too bright, and that's because I'm shooting on manual 2.8 and then on a shutter speed of 1 80th of a second. But I still have to use, of course, exposure compensation. So in this case, when I look at the image, it's a little bit too bright. So I'm going to go to minus 7, minus 0.7. And I think this will look a lot better. Of course, you can use a light meter, but during the stream, I want to do it a little bit fast. So I really like this. But this is a very, let me put it this way, a very distinct look. It's the look from a Fresnel. People love it, I love it too, but it's very distinct. Okay, so let's switch that over, because this gives you a certain look. Okay, so we're going to take this one out, and we're going to do something completely different. We're going to take another LED light, which is also very popular, especially with beauty vloggers. I'm not going to even try. And that's the ring light. Now, what is a ring light? The ring light is actually a light that covers your whole lens. So in other words, you shoot through it and you get shadowless images. Now, I have to be honest, it's not really shadowless because you get a sort of halo around your model, but it looks really nice. So let's put in the power. There we go. Same thing, you're gonna hate this. It's very, very bright again. All our LEDs are pretty bright. Okay, let's turn it all the way up. And let's just aim it up a little bit. There we go. Now with beauty lights, we always place it a little bit closer. So also for a ring light, a little bit closer to our model. There we go. Okay, same settings on the camera. Okay, chin down just a little bit. And you have a lot of reflections on the backdrop now, so I'm going to crop in a little bit. There we go. Really nice. Okay, but this is all very, very flat lighting. It's cool, it's nice lighting, but it's very flat. Now, as you all know, I don't really like flat lighting. I like my lighting to be a little bit more intense. And one of the things that's really cool about, well, beauty lights, and of course also in this case the ring light, is that you don't have to shoot through it. You can actually move it. So let's create a little bit more tension by placing this on the side and letting my model look down. And there we go. And now I have a totally different look. Let's underexpose. There we go. That's awesome. Really nice. Let's make it a little bit flatter. Nice. Okay, that looks nice. So I'm now using it from the side. But hey, can we do more? Yes, of course you can do more. But then we're going to go to slightly different light sources. So in this case, we have broad light sources. So we have the Fresnel, almost straight on our model. We have a ring light, almost straight on our model, and a little bit from the side. 
Now, what if you want to have a little bit more magic in your shot, a little bit more oomph? Let's go for something else. Let's go for the ice light. So I'm going really fast because I don't want to bore you guys too long with those shots. You actually see how it looks, so that's about it. Let me see, ice light. Okay. Now I'm not going to lie to you guys, the ice light is <laughs> incredibly expensive. And in all honesty, is it worth it? I think it is. But only for me with the barn doors. Now without barn doors it gives you a lot of light, without any doubt, so let's turn it on. There we go. So a lot of light as you can see. It's less than the other ones, but hey, it's a lot of light. But how do I work this? Well, with the ice light I found it very, very easy to just hold my camera in one hand, zoom in a little bit, let me see if this is what I want, yes, and then just hold the ice light in the place where I want the light. And there you go, maybe a little bit from the side. And as you can see, it's not spectacular. This is something where you go like, yeah, do I really spend the whole afternoon watching this live stream or do I do something else? If I only do this stuff, you will probably be better off doing something else. And that's why we're going to stop this now. We're going to make it more interesting. So the first thing you want to do is steer that light. That's where the barn doors come in. Now watch this. I'm going to aim it straight at the camera and I'm going to do this. Now you probably don't see any light at all. And just a little bit. Now watch this when I do it on the model. You hardly see any light, right? And that's because we also still have the studio lighting on. So for now we're going to make the studio really, really dark and you're going to see what the ice light can do. So if I disappear, don't worry, I'm still there. So really dark. Going to open it up just a little bit more. There we go. The ring light, Annemiek, are you sure? There we go. Okay. Really nice. Let's turn it down even more. There we go. Okay. So I'm going to grab the camera and I'm going to really take some shots. And what I love about this is you can literally just paint with light. You can create really cool effects. Normally you would use something like flex for this, but with this it just works. Nice. Oh, that's cool. Okay, so with the ice light we can do some pretty nasty stuff, right, with our lighting. We can really pinpoint it towards our model, even if we go a little bit further away. It still works like a charm. Awesome. And to give you an idea, we're shooting about ISO 3200 on 2.8, an 80th of a second. So that's okay. So the ice light, really nice. But we have something else. Let's turn this on. Okay. So the ice light for now, I'm going to do away. Now, what you've seen so far is actually controlling lighting with the more expensive stuff. So a ring light, you have the Fresnel, the Fresnel is of course the most expensive one, the ring light is a little bit cheaper, the ice light is again a little bit more expensive, but you still have to spend some money. And in all honesty, sometimes it's also cool to have something that just gets you out of a pinch. And although the ice light is really cool, you don't really fit it in your bag like, hey, let's throw it in the bag and if we don't use it, it doesn't take up any space. Same thing with your ring light and with your Fresnel, you don't throw that in your bag. But we have something else that you can throw in your bag. And that's, believe it or not, our loom cubes. So let me just show you what we do with this. Now this is a loom cube. It's a really small LED light and it's absolutely amazing. So let's just turn it on. Yep, of course. Hey, Annemiek, do you have the other one there? It's one of those days. It's one of those days where we charge everything I and... already turned it on for you. Uh, you turn it on because you are afraid that I don't know how it works, right? It seems like it. 
don't worry. We're trained professionals. This is what we do for fun. <laughs> okay, so LED light, really small, really powerful. So by clicking up, one, two, three, Nine. There we go. Okay, but as you can see here, I'm holding it on a selfie stick, and that has a reason. Now, of course, I can use it like this on our model, but that's not really fun. Let me show you what we do. So let me first turn off the light again. And let's just hold it like you would expect it to work. So just aim it at our model. We have a super high reflective backdrop. Awesome choice, Annelie. Nice. But this is straight on. And in all honesty, this isn't the kind of shot that I really like. So this is why we use a selfie stick. Now watch this. I'm gonna open up the selfie stick all the way. There we go. And now I can literally just hold it. Can you look that way a little bit? And I can even get in some lens flares. Now, as you can see, I'm now overexposing, so let's underexpose. There we go. Let's go to minus one seven. Oh, that looks a lot better. Nice. Let's get the picture with the LED lighting. Nice. Love it. Chin up just a little bit. Nice. That's cool. So with our Loom Cube, we can actually on location light our model really fast by just aiming one Loom Cube on our model. I hear you going like, hey Frank, is there more today? Yes, there is. And we're going in really fast pace. So can you imagine what happens now? I'm going to go even faster. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, in a week. Um, can you help me out by moving the backdrop? And um, you can change very quickly. I'm gonna go behind the computer. And we're gonna switch backdrops really fast. And let me see if there are any questions. So let me switch back to my camera. There we go. Okay, let me see if there are any questions in the audience. Um, let me see. I saw already the Sony cam connected to the iPad works fine. Yes, that's the thing. What you see now is actually the images coming in through the iPad Pro. And in all honesty, I'm not shooting JPEGs at the moment. I'm shooting the full raw files. So there's 64 megapixels. Now, even when I'm using Smart Shooter or Capture One, and those two are the fastest stuttering solutions I know of, they still aren't as fast as this one. And I think the main reason is because you are using an iPad Pro. So you don't have to worry about an operating system. You don't have to worry about everything just interacting with each other like drivers or maybe a switch that doesn't work. Well, forget about that first one, <laughs> that last one I mean. So in all essence, it's a way safer solution. It's just one cable to your computer and it works. And in this case, the computer of course is the iPad Pro. And it's fast. Uh, we tested it out Saturday for the first time during the workshop. The images came in blazingly fast. The only problem was at the end, I only have 1% left on my iPad. That was really pushing the limit, but we started out with only 70% charge. So in essence, you can do a full day from 10 till four without ever thinking about turning down your iPad or whatever. So that's awesome. And that's the main reason, of course, you want to do something like that on the iPad Pro. Okay, Enwick is changing the backdrop and um, Lois is also changing. So I'm going to set some stuff up. In between, I'm going to show you something that I think is very, very important to understand. Lighting. And of course, we have our instructional videos for that. So I'm going to show you a quick trailer. The reason for this is simply I have to help set up. In this tutorial, we're actually going to show you that you can make great images with very, very simple tools. What to think about a tungsten light bulb. The LED panel. A ring light. A standard flashlight. The Fresnel. The Westcott Ice Light. Smartphones. Loom cube. The chandelier. 
Christmas lights. We call them light snakes over here. This is one of the most creative lighting videos I ever created. I'm very enthusiastic about it. It's available now via our website. See the links. That's the video, I mean, that's absolutely awesome. So if you want to go to the videos, and they go way more in-depth, of course. Digital Classroom goes very much in-depth, but those videos are going way more in-depth. They're better filmed, of course, with multi-camera setups. We also show some uh, retouching. So get the videos, and you also support our work by that. Okay, so which version of the iPad Pro I'm using? I'm using the 12.9 M1 iPad Pro. Uh, the reason for that is actually pretty simple. I use it a lot for Lightroom and even Photoshop on the iPad Pro and of course Affinity Photo, uh, Project Rush, LumaFusion. So I need the faster ones. I did try the 11 inch. Anna Week now actually has the 11 inch and she absolutely loves it. I also liked it a lot, but I found out that for editing, it just, the 11 inch was, it didn't feel cramped. It felt absolutely great, but the 12.9 feels awesome. And if you can choose between feeling great or feeling awesome, you just go for feeling awesome. The only problem is when you want to read a comic or whatever, the 12.9 is too big. So I would advise you guys to get an iPad Air or something for reading that kind of stuff. But overall, yes. Okay, somebody else asked me like, okay, are the files stored on the iPad, Maxot? That's the cool thing. That's one of the things I really wanted. I don't want a tethering solution where only the JPEGs are stored on the iPad. That's useless for me for the very simple reason. If I'm in a trade show environment or in a workshop, I want to be able to very quickly jump into Lightroom, import the images very quickly and just show people what you can do. When I only have JPEGs on my iPad, that doesn't really work. It's no, that doesn't work. So Cascable has the option to store the JPEGs from your camera, if you set it up in your camera. And that goes lightning fast. It's literally like click and it's there. Or you can also store the raw files. Now it stores the raw files on the camera and on the iPad Pro. And the cool thing is, and I can't show you that now, that's the reason why we had to restart the, the stream. But I'm, I'm gonna do a Cascable um, thing later on if you guys want. We're gonna do a video about it. But if you look here, you can actually see that I made a link. And that's the thing. When you normally shoot with Cascable, the files are stored inside the app. And although you can access them, I always find it easier to have one folder on my iPad with, with the name Tethering. And I set it up that the link goes actually from Cascable to that folder. So everything is copied to that folder. Now comes the kicker. And that's the fun part. You can, of course, also make a link to an external hard drive or OneDrive or whatever. So we are trying to get Adobe so far that they will actually support a hot folder on the iPad Pro. And that means that if you shoot to Tethered in the backdrop, Lightroom will actually already start importing those files. Now, again, I only asked Adobe this if that was possible. I didn't get a response yet because I asked it yesterday. So maybe it's possible, maybe not, but that would literally help out. And otherwise just go into Lightroom, go to files, go to that folder and just import those files. So that's no problem at all. And again, that's indeed great that it stores it on that part. Okay, let's make sure that you guys see me. I still have that uh, thing in front of me. There we go, that's better. Okay, let's go for a slightly bigger picture in picture so you guys can also see what we're doing in the studio. And Lois is ready already. Ready already? Hmm. Let's just have some fun. Okay. Um, now for the next setup, I'm actually using a different backdrop, the click prop backdrops, we love those. But I'm also using two non-lights LED tubes. Now those LED tubes are absolutely awesome. During the lockdowns, I actually started using those LED tubes in our home uh, for shooting guitars and for shooting my action figures and whatnot more. It's awesome. And whatnot more, of course, is all nice stuff. So don't worry. But those LED tubes are great. And why are those LED tubes great? One, they output a lot of light. And two, you can literally put them in every color you want. So we can go for white, but we can also go for blue, red, or any color. So let's just set something up. So first we're going to turn this one off. There we go. And we're gonna take that in front of the camera because I wanna show you guys something. So Anawik, is this in the picture? Anawik is going to the camera to show you guys. Maybe make it full screen if you want. Okay, so this is Anawik, this is the Frio. And what type is it? It's the Frio Arch. 
It's the Frio Arch. And the nice thing is, this is a normal boom stand. And as you can see, Annemiek actually put it up here. So you have to tighten it a little bit better. But there's a little thing over here, and I can literally just move it around in any position I want. It's a ball head. It's a ball head, and you have an extra connector here. For, for example, if you want to uh, add a modifier like an umbrella or whatever, or an extra arm of whatever you want to put there. So there's an extra hole there for an accessory. And the nice thing is, with the ball head, I can literally now move it any way I want. So combine that with a boom stand, and now you have a really cool solution. Okay, so let's go for the white one first. So we're going to set it up, and then we're going to add some uh, nice atmospheric lights. Okay, so we're going to start with the white one. We're going to go a little bit higher than this. But first, I want to make sure that I'm on the right color. So let's go for... Yeah, let's go for that one. Nice. Of course, full power. And we want to go a little bit lower. Let's go for 5,500 degrees Kelvin. Okay, and let's place that a little bit close to our model. Aim up. There we go. And then just position it really close. New stuff. And just do it like this. Okay. Close to our model, so we have a really rapid light fall off. And of course we can tilt that. There we go. Uh, maybe come a few steps forward. Just stand here. As you can see now, we have a lot of light in our studio. So this doesn't really work. You don't really see what's happening. So what we're going to do is actually turn off the studio lighting again. Ooh, that looks a lot different. That's way better. And I really like this, but I also like a little bit more Rembrandt lighting. So I am Dutch. Let's move this to the side. That's perfect. That's one of the main advantages of natural lighting and of course also continuous lighting. You see exactly what you're doing. So no excuses if something goes wrong. Chin up just a little bit. There we go. Oh yeah, really like that. Really, really nice. So let's open up just a little bit. So now on minus one seven, let's go to minus one. And again, you can use a light meter, but with an OVF, you really need a light meter with, for example, an AVF like I'm using. The light meter helps, but you can also do it on the screen because I literally see what's coming in. I still need, of course, color checkers and whatnot more to get the colors right. But for the exposure, I can pretty much dial it in by eye. Yeah, we need a little bit extra, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Let's see. In this case, hmm, let's do a little bit warm from the back. So I'm going to start this one up. And let's first go for warm. Let's go for a yellowish color. Okay. You see that they have all the colors in the world. Well, not all the, there we go, a little bit yellow. Okay, mellow yellow, right? <laughs> yes. yes. Yes, baby. Okay, no, don't, don't want too much, just a little bit. Just to give it a little bit of an accent on her jawline. And of course with a little bit of different lighting. So it's yellow against white. And you get something like this. Now of course this is not yet what you want, because it's a little bit messy, right? You see stuff on the backdrop, you see it a little bit on the model, you have that big black area there that doesn't really look nice. So how do you solve this? Well, the first thing you can ask is if your model can actually take the hair out of her face. So the other, yes, there we go. And now move a little bit this way with your head. There we go, awesome. Now this looks already a lot better, but it's still not really there because now I can see the jawline, I can see a little bit of light on the backdrop, but I still feel there's way too much light on the, or way too less light on the side of her face. So let's, Add a little bit in the front. So let's move this. And the cool thing about these LED lights is because they have a pretty much spread out quality of light, we can actually 
also light the backdrop by just aiming it a little bit towards the backdrop. And this is something with strobes that's also possible. With LED lights it's just a little bit easier to see. Chin up just a little bit. Nice, love it. Really nice and dark. Okay, let's open up just a little bit. There we go, and yeah, look all the way there. Nice, love it. Chin down just a little bit. Okay, cool. Okay, now let's say that you want something a little bit more blue. And this is the nice thing about LED lighting. You can just go there and you can just say, okay, let's change it to blue. I'm going to also make it a little bit more interesting now, of course. Because this is all very simple. Let's place it a little bit closer to our model. And let's create a little bit of a lens flare effect. Yeah. Do you like that? Yes. Oh, me too. <laughs> so, yeah, there we go. Chin up. Nice. Love it. Keep your chin up. There we go. Of course, we want a little bit of that light in from the side. Okay, let's take the sun hood off. And let's add a little bit of smoke. There we go. Of course, it's not really smoke, but it does give you that effect. Love it. Awesome. So as you can see, you can do a lot with those little LED lights, but let's make it more interesting. Let's do a split lighting from the front. So we're going to do one on this side with blue. I never did this before, so who knows? Maybe it doesn't work at all. That's the cool thing. And Rick always tells me, don't try new stuff during a live stream. And I keep doing it. But hey, that's the fun part. Okay, there we go. And of course, because we do blue on one side. What's the other side? What do you think? The other side? Red. red. Say red. Red. Do you like red? Yes. Oh my, it's me my too. Color. It's your favorite color. Yes. That's a coincidence. Mine too. So let's see if we can do something with that, with your favorite color. Okay, let's change the color. Okay, there we go. Red right? Or red left? And you never meet her, Frank? I always meet her, but not today. For the very simple reason with LED lights, I have an OVF uh, in older cameras, but an EVF in the modern cameras. And with an EVF, you can literally just see what you're doing. So you don't really need the meter there. It would be better, but hey. Okay, look all the way to the red one. Okay, I have a little bit of a blue spot on her nose, which I don't really like. So let's move that one here. Let's just give a little bit of blue on the side of her face. Chin up. Okay, chin towards me. Yeah, there we go. That's awesome. You chin a little bit more towards the blue, uh, towards the red light. Okay, now we have a big shadow on the side of her nose that I don't really like, so I'm gonna make her look that way. I'm gonna place this one a little bit more forward to get that nice jawline in. There we go, that's nice. Cool. But now I'm shooting these images and I go like, you know, it would be really nice if there was just a normal color in there. Maybe even a strobe. What do you guys think, a strobe? I think a strobe, right? Okay, let's start with a strobe. Let's first turn these off. And there we go. I'm going to place them behind you. I'm going to aim them forward. I'm going to do the same with this one. So I'm going to turn it off. And place it behind you. 
Is the whole studio now dark on a week? Or can you see me a little bit? Okay. Okay, so let's continue with our strobe in the picture. Wow. Because now we're going to up the ante a lot. Because now we have a very powerful light source and two very weak ones. So how does this work? Well, it's not that hard actually, if you think about it. Let's turn our strobe on. All the way down. Now, the most important thing is that you turn your strobe all the way down. So on the lowest setting possible. For the very simple reason, we have a lot of light coming from the strobe and not so much from those little LED lights. So I want to make sure that I don't overpower it too much. So I'm gonna stand really close to our model with my strobe, and I'm gonna feather the light away. So of course I can aim it straight at my model, but then I have a lot more power to compete with. So I can better just feather it away. There we go, it's on the lowest setting, so I'm gonna take a light meter and a trigger. Are there any questions in between, Annemiek? Um, not, really. not real questions. <laughs> Okay. Are there also fake questions, Annemiek? <laughs> At least I have my humor back. Later, Frank, so don't worry. Okay, 1.079. Oh, sorry, 0.79. So I'm going to go up in my aperture, up until 2.8. There we go, 8.50. Now, if you are in doubt with your light meter, let me turn on the lights very quickly and sit behind my desk so you guys can see something that I want to explain to you. Okay, let me change over to my cam very quickly. Okay, so we get a lot of questions about these light meters. Now, when I go and I go for ISO 100, I'm actually getting this meter reading. So 0.79. Now, for a lot of people, this is very, very confusing. They go like, what the heck is for? What the I don't get it. The only thing you have to do is, I know that I'm going to shoot on 2.8, so I'm just going to raise my ISO. Uh, let me go. So I'm going to raise my ISO. All the way, let me do it like this, all the way till I see 2.8. And that's it, ISO 850. Now, I have to explain something about how this, this light meter works. And I advise you guys to set it up the same way. Set your light meter up for full steps. Now, what does full steps mean? Full steps mean it will give you the aperture for 2.8, f4, 5.6, 8, 11, 16. And everything in between will be dictated by 0 0.01, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Now the easy way to remember this is on your camera everything works in one-thirds of an f-stop. So that means if you see 2.83, you go to 2.8 on your camera and you click one click up. It's 3.5 I believe. If you see um, 5.63, that's 6.5. 5.66, that's 7.1. Uh, 5.69, that's f8. So it works really easy if you try it for like a few days. But in essence, when I want to go to 2.8 in this case, I just raise my ISO on the light meter. I don't have to calculate anything myself. And now a ISO 850. So let me see if that really works. <laughs> I hope so, because I can't afford any more mistakes today, of course. So let's grab our camera. <laughs> So ISO 850, so I'm gonna disconnect my auto ISO. And I'm actually gonna go for ISO, let's go for ISO 850. What is it on a week? Our dad is online, Mark. Ah, okay, let's go for ISO. Now, if I'm correct, I would have a properly exposed image at the moment, and I do. Okay, that's awesome. So that's part one. Okay, let me change this over very quickly, because of course I want to make sure that I see what I'm doing. Live view setting effect off. There we go, this is much better. Okay. So we're now using a Hensel strobe, 2.8, ISO 850, or ISO 800 in this case. 
And you, you get an image like this. So this is okay. It's not really great, it's not spectacular, but it's okay. Now let's see what happens if and when we actually start adding LEDs. So we're going to turn this one on. This is the blue one. There we go. And now I'm blind. <laughs> Don't look into the light. And we're going to turn on the red one. And I can already say to you guys, we have to place them pretty close to our model because the closer they are to the model, the more light they emit. Now, when you look at it from the monitor's perspective, it probably looks not so nice. For the very simple reason, you don't see the strobe yet. And this is the main problem with people that shoot combined light sources. So if you shoot just continuous lighting, you constantly see what you're doing. That means that you can just look through the viewfinder, press the shutter and you're done. If you shoot only strobes, you can use the modeling lights and you can figure out how it looks. In this case, this sucks. For the very simple reason, I don't see anything I'm doing because I'm missing my main light. So I have to aim at my model, let my model look that way, and just try it. And there we go. Now, the first thing you will see is that I have a lot of lights coming from the back. I'm using my lens flare. I have a special filter on my camera called a black mist filter from KNF Concept. Really nice. But as you can see, I already have a lot of LED light. Now, what if I want a little bit more LED light? This is the trick. Watch this. I'm just going to lower my shutter speed to, let's say, one fifteenth of a second. Breathe in and press. Now you can see that it's actually starting to blow out. You see that? So this is not what you want. So this is already too much light. Imagine that, too much light. That's awesome, right? So let's go back to a uh, 60th of a second. I really like that. Okay, now let's say that you don't like the strobe that much. You, you like the effect, but you want your main light a little bit softer or a little bit lower in output. How do you do it? First things first. I think on the hands there's a little bit too much light. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my strobe and I'm actually going to take it away from her hands. So I'm going to do this. But, and this is the other thing, if you look at a strobe and it's a strip light with a grid, I always tell people imagine it as being three soft boxes. One a little bit softer, one a little bit brighter and one a little bit softer. So if I use the center part I will have a lot of light output. If I, lose, if I use the sides, I will have less. So there's already less light on our hands. Now when I feather it, like this, straight on, I will have a lot of light, probably 2.8 as we metered before. So I'm not going to do that, because we wanted less light. So what I'm now going to do is I'm actually going to feather it all the way here. So how much do I keep? I don't know. I really should meter that. But in this case, we're just going to wing it. That looks way better. It's not a lot less, but it's just enough. It just gives you a little bit nice atmosphere. Okay, I'm really going to, I'm really getting into the mood of this. I really like it. So let's try some different positions. Let's try to get the light in a little bit. There we go. Nice. Awesome girl. Look at that. Nice. Okay, now what if we want even more? Are you ready for that? Yes. You're really enthusiastic, right? You're really getting into the mood. Hmm, okay. Do you like to hold big sticks? Big sticks? Big sticks? <laughs> Don't think through, just do you like to hold big sticks? Then I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you a really big stick. We're going to use the really large tube. I, I told you, big stick. Yeah, big stick. Yeah, big stick. We're always having a little bit of fun in the studio, guys. Don't worry. It's all safe. Okay. Oops. Oh. Oh, <coughs> don't kill the messenger. Okay, what kind of light do we want from the bottom? But a little bit reddish. Not totally red, but a little bit. Okay, let's turn it on. Now this is a beast. Let's turn it. Uh, what color?
color should we do? It's too red. Nah, too red. Blue. Blue. Yes, I like that. Okay, can you hold it? Okay, play with it. Yes, like that. Play with the big stick. Make it interesting. And as you can see, we're now running into a lot of problems because that light is way too bright. Do you see that? Wow, a LED light that's too bright. So this is also what I wanted to show you guys. If you pay more, you get more. So a lot of people are a little bit reluctant with LED lightings to go for the more cheaper ones and say, ah, you know what, it's a little bit expensive, so let's just go for, well, not too expensive. The problem is, if you shoot photography, or video for that case, you really need a lot of light. So let's just turn this all the way down to 25%. I think that's about the same as those little ones. There we go. I can even now go for F4. Going to make it a little bit more nice and even. Love it. Look a little bit more towards light. What say you, Anouik? I yeah, know. I like it. Uh, maybe a little bit less indeed. Okay, let's go for. Let's just drop the ISO a little bit. Because we have a lot of light indeed. Let's go for ISO 500. Ooh, this is cool. Okay, but what I see through the viewfinder, I like a lot more than what I see actually in my image. So, how do we solve that? Well, it's still a little bit too bright on my strobes. So I'm just going to feather this away. And you might think, hey Frank, is that really what you do? Yes. And look at this, now we hardly have any strobes. I also want to get some of that red in. There we go. Look towards the light if you want. The other light, the, the strobe. <laughs> <laughs> there we go, awesome. Love it. Just tilt your head a little bit that way. Nice. Now it's very difficult, of course, to get the exact nice lighting on her face. It's a little bit too dark now for my taste. And that means that I'm just gonna angle this back. Nothing more, just gonna angle it back a little bit. I'm gonna lower the aperture again, let's say to 2.8. And there we go. Maybe a little bit too bright in this case. So as you can see, I'm still figuring out what I like. So let's go for ISO 200, why not? And as soon as I have my LED lights in order, yes, this I really like. Now I'm going to play with my shutter speed. So I'm going to get the shutter speed a little bit down. Let's go for a thirtieth of a second. Because when I lower the shutter speed, the strobe will do the same, but the LED lights will be a little bit brighter, as you can see here. Really like that. Now a little bit more light on my model from the strobe. And as you can see, we're slowly building towards what I like. Okay, a little bit less. It's just a few inches. Nice. And I can go flat by standing here, or I can go high contrast by actually going here and just shooting towards those lights. And I like those lights in the back. Okay, the main problem I have is that I like those in the back, but the stick is a little bit still too bright, and it's on 25%. So we're going to go even lower on this one. <laughs> That's the sound of the police. Okay, 9%. Wow. So I'm combining now LED light with my strobe, and the LED light is only on 9% of its power. Imagine that. There we go, love it. Okay, this is really nice. Okay, lower angle. Nice. Oh, I like that you play with your hair there. Yes. Nice. I'm not going to include my softbox at the moment, but you can also do that if you think that's cool. Just stand a little bit here and just make it appear in the side. But for me, that's a little bit too, too much. Okay. Of course, also close-ups are really nice with this. Look at that. Nice. Love it. Let's add a little bit smoke. 
and wait until it disappears a little bit. This is way too much. So I'm just breathing on my lens to get that effect. And as you can see, that gives you a really nice diffuse glow. There we go, that's better. Okay, maybe do a wide angle from all the way down. Oh, that's cool. Awesome. Thank you so very much, Lois. And then we did I do all the lights? Yes, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, yes, and we're going to do one more thing. But for that, we're going to do some motion. So I'm going to take this one out. I'm going to turn it off. There we go. And by the way, these are all NAN lights, LED lights. They're a really cool company and very affordable for what they give you and very, very cool to use. And I've been using them for a few years now and they never let me down. In fact, they always give me a lot of ideas to be creative. And that's the cool thing about gear. They have to show you stuff to be creative, right? Okay, so for this one, what I want you to do is I'm going to aim the strobe at you. I'm going to first take a test shot to see if I like the face. Okay, now we need a lot more light from that one because we're now going to combine it with the strobes. Uh, let me see. Yeah, almost Star Wars, right? Hold this. So now we have a lot of light from that thing. Uh, let's go. Let's go for a sixtieth of a second just to test something out. Okay, we can even go up in aperture to let's say a five point six. So much light coming off these things. There we go. Really like this. So we can even. Raise the strobe now, one, two, three, four, five, six. Full stop on the strobe. There we go, I really love this. Okay, hold it really close to your face. Nice. Okay, you can even do some stuff where you turn down the strobe. Very close to your face, very close. You can do, for example, this. It's almost like a Star Wars uh, shot. Love it. And then of course, put the strobes back on for a totally different look. Okay, now I want some action. So what I want you to do is just sweep it in front of when I say yes. Okay. Are you ready? Yes. One, two, go. Okay, as you can see now, we don't see any movement and that's to be expected. First of all, we have to make sure, of course, that we have a low shutter speed. So we're going to go for a very, very low shutter speed of, uh, let's be daring. Let's go for one second. So one full second. Okay, what you want you to do is when I say yes, you just move it. Like that, in front of your face and then immediately away. About one second, so 21. Okay. Yes? Are you ready? First, without your face. Okay. One, two, go. And there we go. As you can see now, way too much. One, two, go. So now we have a totally white area. This means that we're actually getting too much light from that source, right? Not completely right. Let's do something else. Do it on the bottom. Like a dress, so create a dress. So do it like a sweeping effect. Yes, are you ready? Okay, let's, what should we do? One, two, go. Okay, so now we see that our model is moved and our LED light is moved. And this was the whole idea of today, right? We want to make sure that you see the LED light and you see the strobe. So why isn't it working? Well, you have to realize one thing. You remember at first when I told you guys that mixing strobes and LED lights can be a little bit of a problem for the very simple reason that you have that difference in speed and shutter speed. This is a very, very bright LED but I'm actually still shooting for everything that's on the lower settings. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to turn on my strobe a little bit higher. Let's go for, oh, let's meter the light for now. Um, let's put that down on the floor for now. So I'm going to give it a lot more light. Uh, where's my trigger? Oh, there. Yeah. Nee, that is the sonnekap. 
Huh, doesn't matter. Let's take this one. <laughs> okay. So we're now going to set it up first for strobe. Let's go for ISO 100 for now. 2.87. Okay, 2.87. 1, 2, 3, 4. So that's F4 on ISO 100. I'm going to go for ISO 100, yes, F4, and for now the shutter speed, we're going to go back to 125th of a second. Okay, just a very simple shot, only with the strobe. There we go, okay. As you can see here, everything works. Now can you hold it like you're sweeping? Okay, now as you can see, when I shoot, now I can actually see the tube, but I'm still on a way too high shutter speed because, well, see moves, but it doesn't register. Okay, now don't move, and I'm going to lower the shutter speed just to show you guys to, let's say, one fourth of a second. So it's a pretty low shutter speed, and now you can already see that we have too much light coming from the tube. But one fourth is something that I really like if I want to make that motion because one fourth, well, she has to sweep it around. I want to make sure that I see a little dress kind of stuff. So I need a longer shutter speed. So I'm still having way too much light from my tube. So let's turn that all the way down again. Uh, let's go. And again, we're going to go, let's say somewhere around 30%. Okay, first take your test shot. You want to make sure that on your desired shutter speed it doesn't bloom too much. It still blooms too much. So we're going to turn it even more down. Okay, let's go for 10%. Okay, one fourth of a second. Yes, now we have something that I like. Okay, when I say yes, just very quickly sweep and keep your head still. One, two, go. Okay, do it again. One, two, go. Okay. Now what you see is that we can get a little bit of a lighting effect there, but it's still way, way too bright. Okay, that's a problem, right? With a big stick. Come again. Turn it all the way down. Oh. So I'm going to try it all the way down, dim to 1%. Okay, let's try it again. Are you ready? One, two, go. Much better. So now it's not that bright anymore, but I still have way too much light. So do you agree, guys? Yes. So what will happen if I shoot it on one second? Well, I get more light. So let's just raise the shutter speed instead of lowering it. So we're just going to shoot on F4, lower the shutter speed to one fifth of a second, don't move. Okay, one, two, go. Nice. Okay, but I still have way too much light. Now watch this. So I'm shooting on F4. Let's go. On full power. Full power on the strobes. That's about... Not F4, 5.6, 8, 11, 16, I think. Yep. Okay, and now, as you see, now it's almost dark. So let's go down in shutter speed to one fifth of a second. That's nice. Okay, now move it when I say yes. One, two, not yet. <laughs> one, two, go. Okay, and I'll move it twice, very, very quick. Are you ready? One, two, go. Okay, one, two, go. Okay, more extreme. One, two, go. Okay, do it like this, down. So hold it in two hands okay. and just move it down, uh, 
like a twist. Yes, like that. Like you're hitting somebody. Can I go from this? Yeah, can Everything is possible. One, two, go. One, two, go. Okay. One, two, go. One, two, go. Don't hit my strokes. Okay, hold it. Um, don't you think it's too big? A little bit too big, right? <laughs> yeah, just give it to me. It can be done, but sometimes you have to choose your weapons correctly. The only reason I wanted to show you guys this is I'm now shooting already on F16, and the reason is I'm using a very, very long shutter speed to freeze that motion. If you don't freeze that motion, this one works fine. But for motion, we're going to go to the smaller ones. The smaller ones are a little bit more fun for that. So let's just take one of those. So that one was actually on the lowest setting possible, and it was still too bright, even on F16. So we're now going to take this one, and these are of course way smaller, so the model can also have a little bit more fun with these. Okay, you hold that one, yep. and let's take the other one. <laughs> okay, take this one off. There we go. Turn it on. Okay. First we're going to do uh, a basic set. So I want to make sure that I see everything correctly. So hold it in front of your face a little bit. There we go. This is on one fourth of a second. And as you can see, I need more. So let's go down. And I want to end up at around one second. Ah, there we go. With this one, it does work. Okay, for the one second, I want you to hold your face exactly towards there and just move those little ones around like crazy. Are you ready? One, two, go. A little bit closer to your body. One, two, go. Okay, there we go. Go on. One, two, go. Hey, Frank. Yes. One, two, go. I don't understand, Annemiek. There's a white uh, spot behind her. Oh, okay. It looks like her hair, so shouldn't you move her a little bit? Yeah, you can move a little bit towards the side. Okay, now, as you can see, still, we have a lot of light coming, but I can't go any lower. I don't want to go any lower. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to go a little bit slower in shutter speed, uh, uh, faster in shutter speed, sorry. Okay, are you ready? Yes. One, two, go. That's much better. Okay, one, two, go. Okay, try to do a figure eight. Figure eight? Yeah. No. Yes, like that. Okay, one, two, go. And eh, faster. One, two, go. There we go, that's awesome. And then scream without making sound. One, two, go. A little bit closer. One, two, go. There we go. So it's not perfect, as you can see, but it's just the idea, right? So what if you don't want to add motion, but you just want to combine them? Okay, just take a really cool pose with those two next to you. Now, of course, I can lower my shutter, or raise my shutter speed again to go for normal shutter speeds. So let's go for a twentieth of a second. And now you can see that I hardly see my, stro my, my strobe, I see, but I don't see my LED lights anymore. So what do we do? You already know it. We're going to lower this one to 10. Let's go for 6 again. Okay, 4 stops down. So we're going to go from 16 to F4. Okay, cool. And now, as you can see, we can mix those two nicely together. We can even go up in shutter speed again to, let's say, 125th. Why not? Let's try it. And as you can see, the strobe is there. The lights are a little bit too faint, so let's just drop the shutter speed again. It's constantly experimenting what you like. Ooh, love this. For me, the strobe is overpowering it, so let's turn the strobe away like feathering, 
And there we go. Nice, love it. Tilt your nose a little bit. Yes, there we go, that's awesome. Look towards the strobe. Nice. Okay, cool. Let's do it a little bit more flat. Nice. Just look a little. Yes. Okay. You already did it. Awesome. Thank you so very much. Okay. Um, let me go back to the computer. Yeah, just lay him on the floor. It's okay. Anneke, can you, uh, can you turn them off? Yeah. Okay. Oops. Don't fall. Okay, so overall, what I wanted to show you guys is that LED lights combining with strobes can give you a lot of problems if you have too much power or too little power. Now, why do I do it like this? I got an email last week when I announced that we're going to do something with LED lights, and they actually asked me, like, I only want to buy one. Which one should I buy? Well, these ones, in all honesty, these are awesome. They're small, they're very, very powerful, and they're relatively affordable, and you can do almost any color. Now, often, when you want to combine it with strobes, the first idea is go for the biggest one. Go for the one that emits a lot of light. And you are 100% right, that is the way to go. But if you also want to have a little bit of motion in there, you really have to also get one of those smaller ones. So when you buy a LED light, really think about what I'm going to use it for. If you're never going to do motion, get the big one, because then you can shoot on ISO 100, you can combine it with strobes very, very easily, and, well, you can light a lot of areas. If you want to add a little bit of motion and sometimes also add strobes, go for the slightly smaller ones. Okay, I hope you guys enjoyed this, so in the chat just leave any questions you have, and we'll go through the questions. Uh, let me see. Okay, after this I decide I'm getting a Godox AD200. Okay, that can be. And we have some... Okay. Now, let me explain something. We started the photo shoot with the Fresnel. Then we went to the beauty light or the ring light. Those two light sources are actually essential if you want to set up something like a base. Now, those little LED lights you can actually use on the backdrop. So, one time you saw me using them actually as accent lights and main light. But you can also combine them with strobes, for example, to give your backlight a little bit more, um, more oomph. But also, when you look at the size of these, think about what you can do if you just lay them somewhere. So, for example, if you're doing a video broadcast like I'm doing now, you could actually think about adding one for a little bit of accent light, for example, a little bit. <laughs> you know what I mean, right? So you can literally just add a little bit of light from the back. And for video, they're really nice. There's also something else that I like about these ones, and that's actually their magnetic. So you can click them together, as you can see here. You can do this. That was always possible. But the nice thing is you can also mount them on anything that's magnetic. For example, we have something there. It, it will stick, it will stick from the other side. So you can literally just place them wherever you have something that's metallic. There we go. And it's tight. I, I wouldn't trust it too much, like, if you don't press on it, it will fall down. But magnetic is really nice. And of course you have the um, tripod connection, or studio stand connection. Okay, if there are not any more questions, I would like to leave you guys with one final thought. And that is, combining light sources is always difficult, because Everything has to be in balance, but most of all, you guys have to realize what do you want to do. The big one, as you saw me using, and I did that intentionally. You, know, you guys know I'm never going to start out with something perfect. I always work through problems because you guys on location also experience problems. So we don't want to do anything that, yeah, Frank did it at once and now I'm struggling. How, why doesn't it work? The big one didn't work with the motion for the very simple reason, even on the lowest setting it was still too bright. I had to put my strobes all the way to f16. Now you might wonder, like, how is that possible? Very simple, you're using a shutter speed of one second, that's a lot of time to let in available light. Now as soon as we switched to the smaller ones, you saw that my light output went all the way down, and at that point I also had to lower my strobe, that gives me way more latitude and way more options. So when you buy something really on paper, put for yourself what am I going to do with it, 
if I want to freeze motion, forget about it. But if I want to incorporate motion, maybe get one that's not so bright or that can go all the way down. If you only want to do stills, get one that's really bright. But most of all, by the way, if you order anything that has um, like white light, so for example panels, make sure that you get one that has a color temperature adjustment. Okay, no more questions. So that means that for now we're gonna leave you guys. I hope you enjoyed this episode. It was a little bit um, less smooth than normal for the very simple reason we had a lot of problems at the start with one of our docks that literally after five minutes just went poof. That can happen, you know, gear can fail. And I feel very guilty about that, of course, and very responsible. But in the end, it's gear. You, you can't really control gear. And Enoic also has a really nice thing for you guys. We actually just finished translating my book, Photography with a Small Strobe, it's called in Dutch. But we actually translated it into English and then it's called Speedlight Magic. And Enoic is almost done with translating. I believe it's the final stages where we have to get the images I in and done. you are done. <laughs> And then we will actually start selling the book ourselves in English. So if you are into speed lights and you want some magic in your shots, get the Speedlight Magic book. It will be available in about three or four weeks. A couple weeks. of weeks, I don't know. A uh, couple we of weeks. We still have to um, ask permission for Amazon. Okay. Uh, and it will be an uh, e-book and also a paperback. Okay, it will be an e-book and a paperback. So that's going to be awesome. So you can read it on your iPad Pro or iPad Air and you can actually read it on paper. So there was one question. Oh, there's one about, question. Uh, on Facebook. Yes. Uh, from Seth. He didn't have uh, a lot of hurry with the question. Okay. But um, it's, n it's nice. He asked uh, how big should his studio be? Okay. And he wrote a book about it. I wrote a book about how but, big should uh, your studio be. It's that's called. Also in Dutch. It's called Fotografeer in Every Situation. Um, how big should your studio be? If you look at our studio, it isn't that big, but it's huge. And this is the reason why I say it like this. It sounds a little bit weird. It is a large studio space, but if you look at what I use, I actually always use smaller segments. So in our studio, we mostly dedicated everything to two and a half meters by two and a half meters. Let me see if I can get my camera up and running for you guys. So I can show you that very quickly. So let's go for cam on. And let's just go for web stream. Okay, connect my camera. Reconnect, apply. Okay, so now you see my camera. And if you look at our studio, you can see that everything is divided. Oh, let me switch over to the camera, of course. Of course. Okay. So when you look so at our studio, studio, you see studio. that everything is divided everything is by divided pieces. By so, pieces. Pieces. so let me just, so let me just through the studio. The I, studio. Hope I hope you guys didn't have anything, didn't have to, anything eat. to eat. Because it will be a little bit bummy. So here we have so our here podium, we have with, podium backdrop. with this backdrop. is the biggest this is the backdrop, backdrop actually, we actually we use. And then we have, those, then we have those removable backdrops and everything, and everything here, which you, here which you see is actually is built actually on, on 2.5 meters. meters. So, so every set, every set that, we that we use is divided, is divided by, by about, about 2.5 meters. meters. And I found and out that found using that size is actually absolutely amazing. Because you can literally shoot everything you want and it just works. And, and by, by, by using 2.5 meter setups, it means that you don't need a big studio, but then you only have one setup or two setups. The thing is, if you want to shoot with paper, you need a high studio, like about 3.5 meters high, because you also have to mount your paper, you want to shoot under an angle up. So with paper, you need height, but also distance, because if you place a model very close to the backdrop of paper, you will actually get shadows, and sometimes you don't want those shadows. If you use walls like we do, you don't have that problem. You place your model against the wall. So that saves you already two meters distance between your backdrop and your model. The other thing is, you don't need to retouch that much. No, my phone is still on. You don't need... Annabeek, what's the problem? Because people hear you twice. Oh, people hear me twice? That's yeah, weird. Through your telephone and through your microphone. Okay, one moment. I'm going to turn off the audio from the phone. I'm sorry. They shouldn't hear me twice. Well, Anna Meme says he hears it twice. That's weird. Okay, um, let me first show you very quickly how our setup looks. And then I'm going to turn off my phone. Because we got a lot of questions lot about, of questions what, do about what do we use with our digital classroom, our digital classroom, classroom setup. setup. So this is our laptop, this is our laptop where we run, run wire so you see the, the light, light picture. picture. 
and the preview and picture. picture. So this is a Mac. This is a Mac book. The fourteen inch M one. We have we our our RGB mini RGB link. Mini link. So we have so four we cameras have four set up on set up that one, and that we can just switch. Can just switch. Yeah, and we have our, and preview, we have our monitor preview monitor and our, and YouTube, our monitor. YouTube monitor, and we have a new and stream, a new so, stream. so we don't have a lot of viewers now. now. And of course, and this, of is course this is then my camera. My camera. And, over, and here, over here, we now have the we iPad, iPad Pro with the with USB C connected, connected and Cascade, and which is now taking over. So you can actually see the iPad Pro down a little bit. A little bit. That's the iPad that's Pro the iPad with Pro, a USB-C USB cable, cable, and that's and how we that's shot how we Tether today. Tether okay, today. so let's okay. switch back to this and let's, and turn, let's turn off the phone. Off the phone. Let's just, let's just turn, turn that turn down. down. Close all. Okay, and let's go back to my camera. Okay, now you should only hear me once. Okay, so how did I start it with that? Oh yeah, the the big the size of your studio. So in essence, it's the same with buying your LED lights. Don't get too uh, get too big that's not never a problem but don't be forced yourself into get let me rephrase that if you want to get a new studio make sure that you immediately think about the room so if it's a really huge room you can use paper you can use several sets if you have to work in a smaller space like for example your living room or your attic or whatever that's actually when it's very very important that you start to think about what should I do with my sets? Because if you are in your attic, why not create an attic set with a little bit of maybe uh, spider webs, um, like a little bit of a back door where light is coming from. Y you can create so much stuff in an attic. The only problem is, of course, if you build a set, it's always that same set. So what we did over here is we created removable backdrops. So that means we just have big plates with wallpaper and we just can move them around in the studio. So wherever we want, we can just move them around. And that's the same on the floor. We have hardwood floors. It's not hardwood floors, but it's a wooden floor. But we also use um, vinyl, which you can normally, uh, vinyl, vinyl. I hope you guys know what I mean. It's what you normally use in your kitchen or maybe in a, in a bedroom. It's what you put on the floor, right? And it looks like wood, but we also have it in metal. Uh, we have it in old wood, uh, damaged um, uh, tear drops or whatever. You can do whatever you want and you buy them small. So we normally buy them with maybe three meters on the roll. And then you pay about 10, 15 euros if it's the last part on the roll. And you can use it on your floor in the studio to create different sets. Don't think about expensive stuff. Always think about getting it as cheap as possible. And final that you use normally, if you go to your do-it-yourself store or your, um, how do you call it, Ikea, or I don't know how those, the, the, the businesses where you go if you want to decorate your home in English, I don't know, sorry. <laughs> but go there and just buy everything that's on the roll. So just go in there and say, hey, do you have anything left that you can't sell? Yeah, we have two meters of that, okay, give it to me. Uh, we have three meters of that, okay, what do you want for it? And they often will charge you like half price or maybe they will charge you full price, but at least you have something that you can use in your studio. And by using that kind of stuff, you can literally change the backdrop immediately or change the floor immediately with a very, very cheap solution. Now, of course, the other backdrops we're using is the click prop backdrops. That's the one you saw uh, me using the second one, the old tapestry. And they are specialized in giving photographers backdrops that don't have any shine. So in other words, the first backdrop I used was actually wallpaper and it shined a lot. The second backdrop was actually the click prop backdrops and you saw that I didn't have any reflections there. Now, if you buy online those backdrops, you sometimes have reflections and shimmering or, uh, or structure in those backdrops. So the click prop backdrops are a little bit more expensive, but they are absolutely awesome. Okay, let me see. Uh, any other questions? No. Okay, that's great. So I would like to thank you guys very much. Um, our, we always end with stay safe, of course. And when is the next digital classroom on a week? Okay, in between, Anna Week is looking it up. April 13th. Oh, April. It's on April 13th. It's also a Wednesday. Oh, it's a Wednesday. That's, that's Christ. And in three weeks. Maybe we're going to do something with smoke. Okay, we can do something with smoke next time. Why not? Let's do a smoke real workshop. Smoke, not real breathing. smoke, not breathing, real smoke. Do you guys want to see real smoke the next digital classroom? If yes, just leave comments below. Say, yes, we want smoke. 
And anything else, just leave comments below. Again, sorry, it was a little bit hectic and I was a little bit nervous, but that's because we are testing the case cable now. It works like a charm, but our dock literally just imploded somehow. And that gave us a lot of stress. So I was not myself our today. Our USB dock. Our, our, our USB dock exploded, not our dock. <laughs> Chewie is still breathing and alive. He's walking over there, so he's, he's still nice. <laughs> Exploding dogs. Did you ever see an exploding dog? <laughs> Besides <laughs> cartoons? No, of course not. We are all for animal health. Okay, guys, see you again next time. 